Okay, let's talk a little bit about post-processing in Chapter 8 in our textbook. Here's some objectives. We're going to keep it pretty short and sweet. Um, I want to make it sure that we can differentiate between the terms reconstruction and reformat. Reconstruction and reformat. They are very different processes from the computer's point of view, um, but they look kind of similar from the technologist's point of view. Um, we're going to give examples of, of post-processing reconstruction protocols, and um, that's not going away. Uh, we will continue to think about post-processing reconstruction um, even next week when we talk about dosimetry. I've got an exercise related to post-processing because it is a way that we can reduce doses, making sure that we understand how post-processing should work. And then we'll illustrate various types of post-processing image ref reformats. And the one that's missing from this would be like the PET-CT type reformats that we can do. So fused imaging as well as any kind of what do they call them, attenuation corrections? Um, I won't be talking about those. I'm just going to be talking about strictly CT type uh, imagery formats. So I will also, to the same point, I won't be talking about radiation therapy type imagery formats. So post-processing, um, these scans, scanners that we're working on now, have, we have opportunities to manipulate both the raw data and the image data. So anytime we're doing a reconstruction, we are working with the raw data. Anytime we're doing a reformat, we will need the image data. Um, and so, the, in the world of reconstruction, the raw data is going to be used to um, create the pixels and everything for a new image. So we're literally rebuilding the entire thing. Um, I, I don't know if anyone is a hardcore computer nerd like me, but I think about it like Minecraft. When you tell the Minecraft engine to rebuild a new world, that is reconstruction. It's rebuilding an entirely new world. Uh, reformatting is when the image data is assembled to produce images at, in different planes or produce 3D images. So again, within the world of Minecraft, if I build a castle, I'm reformatting the world of, of Minecraft to have a castle in it. Um, in this case, with CT, uh, with the CT images, we're able to do like 3D images. We're able to do um, images in different planes, like oblique planes or coronal planes or sagittal planes, with that image data. So often we'll need to do some kind of retrospective reconstruction, and typically the computer is already. Um, told there's already a protocol in place to initiate retrospective reconstruction um, like at different window settings or different um, fields of, of view like a coronal uh, re retrospective reconstruction might be pre-formatted into for example a, a stone protocol so we'll, we'll scan the patient um, you know along the axial or transverse plane and then as the, once the computer is completed with its reconstruction, it's going to automatically initiate reformats in the coronal plane because it's helpful for the physician to look at that coronal plane if they're looking for a stone like in the ureter or something. So, um, so anytime we're doing a, a retrospective reconstruction, though, um, the parameters can be changed, right? Um, the respective orientation will be the same. Um, so I may, have, I may have just kind of confused the point a little bit here, um, and I apologize for that. But the parameters that we can change retrospectively, so say for example, we scan a patient and the display field of view is too small, right? We can retrospectively reformat that to increase the display field of view. Um, we, can we can change image center retrospectively. We can move where the images are centered retrospectively. Um, we can also change, for example, something like a reconstruction algorithm. So if it was reconstructed based on a bone protocol and we want to reconstruct with soft tissue, we could change that. We can also change slice incrementation, and we'll talk more about that next week when we talk about dosimetry, uh, as well as slice thickness, and that's only on these multi-detector systems. Overlapping reconstructions. Um, she, uh, in our textbook, talks about um, ways to determine when to do overlapping reconstructions. Um, so 
this means that we can produce images that even though the, even though the, the pitch was greater than one, we can produce images retrospectively that overlap, right? Because we have a volumetric set of data. Um, so, for example, I'm going to draw here just a little bit. If the pitch was greater than one, the, um, there might be little gaps between where slices were acquired, right? And those little gaps are what we're talking about when we talk about a need for interpolation. We're trying to figure out what's in those gaps. Since this is a spiral-shaped cut, we have a volume, and so we can interpolate and figure out, to some degree, what's in those gaps. But if we really want to see it more clearly, what we might need to do is an overlapping reconstruction where we tell the machine to go ahead and reconstruct additional slices that cover the gaps. Okay? So we're going to create a bigger data set, but we've not increased, increased the patient dose. We've not increased the patient dose. Um, we do 50% overlaps pretty commonly, especially if we're talking about um, small slice thicknesses. We almost always will do some kind of overlapping reconstruction. One of the fancy terms that she throws in there is, again, isotropic voxels. What is she talking about? She's saying that if the slice thickness is the same as the length along the z-axis of this volume of data. So in that instance, we would have a set of data, right, that lines up perfectly. We would not need to do any kind of overlapping reconstruction here because this volumetric nature of these voxels, basically essentially the pitch is one, and so there's no need for overlap. So it is another way, it's perhaps a, a geo, what would, what would the word be? Um, a graphical way of thinking about um, the idea that if we have a pitch of one, we do not need to do overlapping reconstructions, okay? Um, the way that that looks is the voxels will be isotropic. They will be the, si the same size. The x and y axis will be the same size as that z axis, that incrementation. We can also retrospectively change slice thickness, and this is something that we do pretty frequently if we want to minimize the amount of data that we're sending to a radiologist, because they have to interpret every image that we give them. Um, so scanning at a smaller slice thickness can produce images that have a better spatial resolution, but then you have to interpret every single one of those tiny, tiny slice incremented images better for the radiologist for us to just combine those in like two or three of those slices into a single image we will have the enhanced detail but not the enhanced data right so that's the thinking in retrospectively changing slice thickness typically it will maintain the high uh, high resolution um, but it creates more manageable files <clears throat> When we talk about image re re reformation or um, image rendering, I'm, I'm typically, I typically think about reformats. So we've kind of made a distinction between um, retrospective reformatting and reformatting, right? Um, I, I think that distinction is a little arbitrary. It's all just reformats to me. You can do them in a number of different ways. Um, so. To, re to reformat a CT study, all the source images must have the, uh, an identical display field of view, image center, gantry tilt, and no gaps. Okay? When I'm talking about gaps, I mean like, not like pitch gaps, I mean like I scanned the person's chest and I skipped over the abdomen for some reason and then I scanned their pelvis. Um, if I did that on a single acquisition, I would not be able to, it would, it would limit the way that I could reformat. I could select just to reformat the chest, um, so I could limit the area that I wanted to reformat um, and work around it, but I cannot work around like a change in display field of view. So we used to see this some in the past, or if you're ever doing like a neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, sometimes the display field of view for the neck will be really small, 
and then the chest will be larger and the abdomen will be larger, uh, you would need to maintain the same display field of view, the same large display field of view throughout if you were hoping to do uh, any kind of coronal reformats or 3D reformats or for fusing the images in PET-CT or for treatment planning in radiation therapy. We would, want, we would not want to mess with that display field of view. Okay, so anytime that they're doing treatment planning for radiation therapy, they have this in the back of their mind, and they're going to keep that CT scan pretty basic. It's just going to be like start and end. Don't mess with anything, right? Because they want a single volumetric set of data they can do these massive reformats on. Um, so the complexity is not the CT scan, it's what they're doing with it afterwards. Um, likewise with gantry tilt, although I think gantry tilt's kind of going away as we move towards um, bigger and bigger scanners. Multiplanar multi reformats, these are sometimes called MPRs. It might look like that on your system. Um, these will typically be two dimensional in nature. And. Um, They will display the original CT attenuation values. That's important because it means we can put an ROI on it and it will report whatever the attenuation value was for that. So we can, with it, if we're working with an NPR, we can place ROIs on it and it will give us meaningful data. Um, we can do these uh, transverse, coronal, sagittal, or even just make up a crazy plane and do an NPR on that plane. Uh, and here's some, uh, I guess, examples. The first one is uh, coronal, then a sagittal view, and then this other one, we do this oblique view pretty commonly for um, like aortic, CT aortas, or sometimes for uh, uh, CTAs for pulmonary embolism. We'll do an oblique plane to the heart so that we can see, for example, the entire aortic arch or all of the pulmonary um, arteries in a single slice so that we can look for blood clots or ruptures or whatever. So we'll do it at an angle that just prioritizes the, uh, the aorta or uh, pulmonary arteries. Curved planar reformats, these are pretty fancy and they normally do require some kind of third-party software. There are some scanners that have uh, preset curved planar reformats that work well. But what they've done, if you can imagine, I believe this is uh, the common carotid artery and its bifurcation, right, into the internal and external carotids. Um, what, if you can imagine, if you can imagine the carotid arteries in your mind on a single side, um, at the point of the bifurcation, one goes internal and one goes external, right? So the idea of seeing both the common carotid artery and these, the, the arteries after the bifurcation on a single slice is impossible. If I was just looking at it in a sagittal plane or even in an oblique plane, the way that these things diverge, I would not be able to see them on a single image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the computer, I'm actually going to plot waypoints along the carotid arteries. So up the common carotid, past the bifurcation, I will plot both the internal and external right? Then the computer is going to create, if you can imagine this, a slice protocol that is curved exactly like what I told the structure is curved. So it's going to make a wavy knife blade, if you will, and that wavy knife blade is going to slice through the patient until it hits and I'm able to see everything that I need to see on a single slice. Does that make sense? Um, so this is getting pretty fancy already. Um, we are manipulating the data in all three dimensions as well as in time because if you look, the, the reason I'm able to clearly delineate that's a common carotid artery and not a vein is because it is very patent with, with contrast. So the arteries have contrast in them, the veins do not. So this was taken right in that instant when the, there is contrast in the arteries but not yet in the veins. Three D reformats. Now you might say this looks a lot like an NPR, right? This looks a lot like a multiplanar reformat. It is not. This is called a MIP or maximum intensity projection reformat. Um, 
it is the computer is going to select the voxel. It's going to select the data point on any given slice that has the maximum value of any other data point, and it's going to only project that voxel. This is very helpful if we're chasing contrast, because contrast is always going to be the brightest thing around. So we can tell the computer, I only want you to show me the brightest thing around, right? And it's going to really light up. In this case, here's a really good example of, um, I'm going to zoom in here, of an oblique plane, MIP, that is in demonstrating the entire aorta, right? So it's a maximum intensity projection of the entire aorta, and the, the technologist has told the machine, I want this plane to match the area of the aorta so that I can see the entire aortic arch. If this seems a little overwhelming, that's fine. I don't expect you, this is, I'm talking about something that's very theoretical right now. If, you were, if we were sitting there in front of a CT machine, which I hope that we'll be able to model some going forward in the summer, this is really just a matter of manipulating the data. If you're just playing around with it, um, almost like, I don't know if anyone's ever used Adobe Photoshop or something like that. We are Adobe Photoshopping the images. Okay? Um, the, the stuff that I really want, even though I'm going to talk about it kind of at this elevated level, because it is important that we, we understand some of this stuff, what I really want you to be able to tell me is, okay, for, for MIP, what does a MIP mean? And what would the images look like? They're going to look really bright. The contrast is going to look really bright. Now, since it's selecting the voxels that have the highest value to display, I cannot now place an ROI on it and get any meaningful data out of it. Because it's selected already the, the voxel that has the highest attenuation value. So the ROI, all I can, I, can, I can do measurements. I can do like distance measurements or size measurements, but I can't do attenuation value measurements, right? Because it's already, it's negated that and just said I want the maximum, the maximum attenuation. But these are a powerful tool, especially for any kind of arterial work. So we can see real clearly um, uh, coronary arteries, um, blood vessels uh, with blood clots in them, things like that. 3D reformats. Um, I'm trying to see, where is this in our textbook? She, um, she goes into quite a bit of detail on 3D reformats starting on page 85. Um, the one that is probably the most interesting to us is volume rendering. So if you read about the um, surface rendering, um, that's kind of become dated. Every time I think about surface rendering, I think about, if, again, if anyone's ever been playing a video game and you, you're walking around in the castle or whatever and you can see a hole in the castle, like in a corner, right? And you can kind of see through the castle to maybe either something outside the castle or just something out in the middle of nothing right? It's like the, the map has kind of opened up and there's a irregularity there. Anytime I think about surface rendering, I think about that because surface rendering had just that problem. Anytime there was a corner and there's contours and corners all over our body, anytime there was one of those, you could like, you could see through the bone to something that wasn't there, to like an infinite space that didn't really exist. Um, that's surface rendering. It had that limitation to it, and so she talks quite a bit about it. It's largely gone away. What we do now is we have the processing power, we have the software in place to do 3D reformats as volume rendered, right? So the volume rendering will allow us to, we're never going to see through the map. We will always have, there will always be some material within the map. Um, another way to think about it would be like a pinata versus a stuffed animal. Right? Pinatas are always going to be hollow, right? They're always going to have that surface rendering is always going to render the surface of it, the, the interior will be hollow. Versus a stuffed animal will always have cotton or something inside of it, right? I don't know if anyone's seen, a, what is it, Stranger Things or whatever, that has a really weird stuffed animal in it. Um, so this 3D structure, we can create it as a semi-transparent thing. Um, and 
it has this volume rendering has become the the favored model for the reasons that I've just talked about and all of the voxels will be used to contribute to the image so it requires extra processing in fact it, it almost always requires a separate workstation or perhaps even that we send the data somewhere else like there are labs for example in San Francisco where you send them the data and they will do the 3D rendering okay um, Becoming someone who is good at 3D rendering um, is one of the reasons why they, there's terms that sometimes evolve in the literature like super tech. I don't know if you've ever heard the term super tech, but a super tech is a super user, right, who has access and who understands how to do things like 3D rendering, right? Um, there's ticks, there's um, kind of tips and tricks for how to do it on any given software, um, I've been a super tech in the past on Terra Recon, and so I'm still a big fan of Terra Recon because, again, it's a third party. So I can send data to it from GE or from a Siemens machine and do what I need to do to make whatever kind of picture the doctor wants. We can also do endoluminal imaging, and this is when we talk about this, we're talking typically about um, CT colonography or C, uh, virtual colonoscopy. Um, either of those terms might be used. And typically, this is done purely by the computer. So we will, um, the, we will give the patient some kind of bowel prep. We will do um, a CT scan. I think a lot of times there's air contrast that's used as well, so the bowel needs to be completely clear. We will uh, in, introduce air contrast to the large colon. We will scan the patient on their belly and then also on their back. And then the computer will create these images that look like, again, something out of a creepy video game where you're flying down a tunnel and that tunnel is the person's colon. Um, I don't know how else to say it. So the power of this is that it allows us to detect polyps, particularly ones that are deeper, like in the ascending colon. Sometimes, for whatever reason, uh, the GI doc might not be able to get a scope all the way up and around every bend that they need to get to. So in that case, that might be a good candidate for um, someone to get this endoluminal imaging. Or a BE. Or a BE, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know which is worse, the, the barium enema or the air enema, and you have to flip over on your belly and your back. Both sound kind of miserable, but it's better than cancer, I guess. Region of interest editing. Um, so she talks about different ways to manipulate this data. And I, I, again, I'm not expecting y'all to become experts or super techs in this stuff. That's something that would be several years down the road. It is very interesting stuff, and I think making these kinds of images is amazing. That picture of the 3D heart that I had up there, that's my desktop. That's my screensaver on my computer. I think it's just a very inspiring image that we can do. And that's completely movable. Like, you can rotate that heart in any direction. You can fly in and out of the heart. The, the power that has come with it is really cool. So there's a couple of different ways that we might arrive at that picture. One is the technologist might literally manually segment or um, shave off sections of the anatomy that they don't want. And so they talk about segmentation that in that RSNA video, um, that it might be a manual process where the, a, a doctor or a technologist very carefully cuts away all the bone that's apparent on the image in order to see just uh, the heart or cuts away all of the arteries or cuts away all of the soft tissue to see just the arteries, right? Um, we can also use automated processes. Um, so one of the things, one of my favorite ways to do this kind of segmentation stuff is you find, for example, the carotid artery. It has good contrast in it. You can literally just hold your mouse on it and push go and everything that has that attenuation value is just going to start to grow out from there. So it's the, it's the coolest thing in the world. If you do it well, like with a single click of a mouse, you can grow the carotid arteries all the way up to the circle of Willis and even some of the arteries in the brain. And you get just the arteries from the neck up to the brain. Um, so that would be an automated process or semi-automated process. This is um, important. There are 
ways that we can screw up this process, of course. Um, and so it's, it's important to recognize what some of the errors are that can result from this. Um, this over here is what we would call a stair-step artifact. And this results when we use wide or like thick cut images for this kind of reformatting. So we might need to, and so what, what's actually happening is twofold. We have the heart motion, right? So you can actually see the heart motion. Let me zoom in here. The heart motion like here and here, right? The heart is beating, and so it got different slices and different beat phases of the heart. Plus, the data is thicker, right? So it created this, like you're stepping down stairs, right? Another way to get this artifact would be to try to do any kind of reformat like this using axial data. So this is one of the reasons why I asked you to cross out the section on axial data in your book um, because if I, if I am using axial data, since it's not volumetric data, I will get stair-step artifacts anytime I try to do anything outside of the plane that it was acquired in. So if I try to do a coronal reformat or an oblique reformat, I will get this artifact. Um, the same is true for any kind of PET-CT fusion. It will probably disable PET-CT fusion. I'm not exactly sure on that, but I know it would make the computer, it would make the computer work a lot. Um, the same is also true for any kind of treatment planning. So if I'm trying to do, for example, this is a lung, a lung cancer treatment plan that I'm developing here, and I have this data set, it's going to be very difficult to plan treatment off of this data set because I've got this artifact, and the computer can't tell what is heart and what is lung, what's the area that you're actually trying to treat. Um, so that, again, is, is, is something we want to avoid. I'm going to zoom back out. We could have segmentation errors. So when I said earlier that we might use a semi-automatic process to grow out the carotid arteries, right? So I might place my cursor on the carotid artery, and the computer just starts to grow everything that has that attenuation value, right? Well, the computer can't tell the difference between that carotid artery attenuation value and the attenuation value of the base of the skull, right? So when the carotid artery gets to those funny little channels that they go through to get into the, into the brain, the, the computer will start to then grow out the skull as well, right? So I will then probably either have to recorrect it or maybe do a region of interest edit where I shave away the bones of the skull from the carotid arteries. Um, that would be a segmentation error. When in the video, in the RSNA video, they were talking about how significant segmentation errors are for 3D printing. So if I just want a map of, for example, a fracture, like a skull fracture, we're going to do a repair of a skull fracture, but we want to map out exactly what the fracture looks like. Um, as I'm doing the segmentation for the skull to get away the, the brain, the soft <laughs> tissue, any kind of staples or whatever else might be apparent on the image, I'm going to be very careful with that. Because whatever I send to the 3D printer, that's what it's going to print, right? So if I didn't remove a staple from the image, or if I left soft tissue on the image, it will print that as part of the volume. If there's noise on the image, if these are really noisy images, the computer will just continue to have really noisy images. And it could potentially degrade certain kinds of reformats, especially the 3D reformat. So we, we want to have high resolution. Artifacts that might result in errors, again, in image reformats would be motion, any kind of metal artifact with the streaks that it produces, as well as what we talked about, the stair-step artifact. Okay, that was it for reformats. This is 3D reformats of a CT scan of a lion, if I remember right. I can't remember what zoo it came from. It looks like the cover of a heavy metal album.